Um, we got a great speaker for you tonight. We have Max Tager, and I want to turn over the microphone to him right now and let him get started. Thanks. Uh, hey guys, I'm Max Tiger. Uh, this is my talk, Calling Objective-C at Runtime. Uh, so the first thing I want to jump into is why call Objective-C at Runtime. Um, well, in general, I don't really think you should. Uh, it's not very good for performance to be calling stuff at runtime, and uh, you also lose some static typing benefits when you do that. Uh, but sometimes it's really useful or even essential to solve a problem. Uh, and I want to talk about a situation where it was really important for me uh, to have this available in Objective-C. So I work at a startup called Hazap. Uh, I worked there about three years. Uh, about two years ago, we started up being an ad network. So we were one of many SDKs that game developers integrated to show ads in their app. And if you're not familiar with the space, they show uh, maybe ads from seven different ad networks. They have a whole lot of them to maximize their fill rate. Um, so what we eventually developed was this thing called ad network mediation, where we became the one SDK they used. And uh, we just communicated with all of these other different SDKs at runtime. So out of maybe the 12 or so that they wanted to use, we support all of them, but they're only using a subset of about three of them or so. Uh, and this ends up creating some interesting constraints that we have to do in our programming. Uh, notably, when we're in this situation, we can't statically reference the SDKs that we're targeting against. Um, if I was to use the Vungle SDK, normally you use code like Vungle SDK play add to show an ad. Uh, but if we include that code in our SDK, then it creates a compile time dependency uh, on having Vungle SDK as a symbol in the final app the developer makes. Uh, so basically, that's unacceptable. So as a way to work around that, we load up all of these third-party SDKs at runtime, and that's how we interact with them. Um, I don't have too many other use cases that I can think of for all of this runtime programming that I'm specifically going to talk about, but there are definitely a lot of offshoots. I saw someone on Stack Overflow asking about if uh, someone else's SDK was present and their SDK could somehow optionally interact with it. And they didn't specify exactly what they were going to do, um, but I speculate that maybe if an exception tracker was present, then maybe if your SDK catches an exception, then you could track it. Uh, or if an analytics SDK is present, then maybe your SDK could track analytics somehow without depending upon an exception tracker being there. Um, other things you could do are uh, you could use some iOS 10 features without having compile time dependency on them before iOS 10 is actually out, maybe. Um, or you can interact with Apple's private APIs. By the way, probably the last two things there would be a big no-no for Apple in the actual store, but they would be really useful, uh, especially for uh, use cases where you're just on the simulator or doing tests or something. So the first thing I want to talk about is just a first approach to how I might interact with stuff at runtime. And this is stuff that um, I could have probably figured out when I was writing my first iOS app um, using NS class from string and perform selector. So NS class from string is pretty straightforward. You pass a string and you get back a class if it's present. Um, perform selector, I just want to do a little bit of background on selectors in case people aren't familiar. Uh, selector is a message sent to an object. And it's usually the name of a method to call for that object. Uh, and just an implementation detail, selectors are C strings that you can compare based on pointer equality. Um, those are also called intern strings. So that's just a, a performance enhancement so that when you're calling methods, you're not actually doing string comparison to figure it out. It can be much faster than that. So here's how it would look to use NS Classroom String and Perform Selector to call something at runtime. Uh, basically, you just load up a class with NS class from string, and that gives you back a class object. And then you call perform selector and use at selector to create your selector to uh, call a method on it. And that'll work great. Uh, but there are a couple caveats to doing it this way. For one thing, you'll get warnings if you use selectors that are not present anywhere in your app. If you do at selector foo, you'll get the warning undeclared selector foo. Um, and it's actually easy to work around that. You can just use Pragma clang diagnostic ignored dash w undeclared selector, and your problems will go away. Uh, maybe a little bit inconvenient, but you can work around that. But there are actually more important downsides to doing it this way. 
Notably, you can't pass multiple arguments to perform selector. You're limited to by what you can do. Uh, I think you can only pass zero or one arguments to it. You also can't pass primitives like int or bool. So very quickly, you can't use perform selector as a solution to call stuff at runtime. Um, it's just not gonna work out. So if you do wanna use those features, you need to use something like NS invocation. So here's a code sample of how you use NS invocation. I'm just gonna walk through this sample. First, we load up our class with NS class from string. Then we call method signature for selector and pass our selector to that class and that gets, gives us back an NS method signature. Then we use the invocation with method signature with the signature to create the actual NS invocation. And now we start configuring the invocation. First we set the target, which is basically the object that is receiving the message we're sending. Next, we set the selector, which is the message we're sending. That's the method we're calling in this case. And then next, we set the actual arguments. Uh, so you'll note that when we call set argument here, uh, that we're passing it um, a pointer to a pointer in this case. Set argument always takes a void star, so it's dynamically typed. Uh, and that necessitates why all the arguments are split across two lines. First, where we declare it, and then where we pass the pointer to it. Uh, and then the other thing I want to point out that's a little weird about NS invocation is you can see that you start your arguments at index 2. So the reason that is, as, as you may or may not know, um, in Objective-C, the first and second arguments are always uh, the object self and then the selector, uh, usually underscore CMD is how you access that. And then the actual arguments started 2, 3, 4, and 5, and so on. Uh, finally, you call invoke on the invocation, and you can call one method at runtime that way. So this approach has a lot of downsides, as you can imagine. First of all, basically, you have dynamic typing going on all over the place. So in your first line, in a class from string, uh, you might type the wrong class name uh, or provide the wrong class. The at selector you do, maybe you choose a selector that does not, uh, is not actually implemented by that class. Set target, you can pass the wrong value. Set selector, you could pass the wrong value. Um, every time you call set argument, those are all void star arguments. So uh, there's no type safety there. All, all the time you've got at index going on, if you pass the wrong index value, um, which is really easy to do if you're moving around arguments, then uh, you've also maybe crashed your app, and even the get return value uh, is also using void star. So really this is not a great solution uh, for someone who really likes static typing as much as myself. Also, this code is really ugly. Um, call me shallow, but I don't want to write code like that was on the previous slide. It's just really unacceptable for code to be that way. Uh, and it was really long. It took 17 lines, not including all the extra white space I had to add, to use NS invocation like that. Uh, that was just to call a single method, so it's not going to really work as a large-scale solution to calling stuff at runtime. So this next approach I want to talk about uh, is much, much better. It resolves many of the issues with using NS invocation. Um, basically, what we're going to do is create a subclass of NS object, and it's going to be a dummy class with the same methods as the class that we're actually trying to call the methods on. Um, so if you'll remember in our use case, I'm trying to call methods from these third-party SDKs that uh, are in part of the app, but I can't have a compile time dependency on them. So, but my dummy classes can have the same method system. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to load up the real class using NS class from string. And I'm going to make the compiler think I'm using the dummy class when actually I'm using these real classes that I'm actually trying to interact with. So here's what that looks like. Uh, in the app interface, it's really simple. We just subclass NS object. And then I've named my class HZ add colony. Uh, because the real class that I'm trying to interact with is add colony. Um, and I just copy and paste their methods into my header file. Uh, that's really easy to do. Um, just straight exactly what they've typed. And then the implementation is actually even simpler. We have an empty implementation file, and we use this pragma clang diagnostic ignored dash w incomplete implementation. And that tells the compiler to just ignore the fact that we haven't implemented any of these methods that we claim to. To call an instance method with this, uh, with this approach, we load up our class with ns class from string. And then on that class, uh, which I've called c, we call alloc init and we get back an instance. And then we can call instance methods on it as normally. 
So basically, the compiler thinks we're using this HZ add colony instance when really um, we're using the add colony instance that we've loaded with NS classroom string. And class methods are uh, very similarly, very simple. We just load up our class again with NS classroom string, um, and then we call class methods as normally on it, as you can see in this example. Um, but there's still a couple of downsides to this approach. First, we lose static typing for class methods. Um, as you saw in the previous example, we had to load our class as a variable C with NS classroom string. And when we do that, we no longer get the compiler checking that that class actually implements the methods we're calling on it. So we lose out on some static typing there. Also, we lose autocomplete for our class methods. And it's a big deal in Objective-C because we have such long method names. Uh, it becomes really difficult to deal with. In fact, I'd say it's a complete deal breaker for calling stuff at runtime. Uh, as a demonstration, this is me typing out that whole method without having autocomplete there. It's gonna end up taking me about three seconds. Uh, and this is like a best case scenario for me doing this. Uh, this is my like third take for this video. I've got the whole <laughs> method right there. Uh, and it's still just a struggle. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a typo in just a second where I type a dollar sign instead of a four. Yeah. It does, it does. Uh, exactly, it's not gonna replace it. Um, basically, the only point of our own version of the class, like our HZ ad cloud in this example, is to make the compiler think that there is some object that implements all these methods, so um, autocomplete and everything works as normal when you call it on instances. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly, yeah. It's, yeah, we're basically using like id when we create the class um, and to make the compiler think that we're using this. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Go ahead. Um, so you could do the same thing. Uh, I don't think there'd be any limitations to using a protocol about it. Yeah, you, let's see here. I'd say basically what you, I think it should work. Um, Oh, that would um, actually work perfect for this solution as well. Um, I'll talk in a second about why I'm not gonna do that approach. Um, there's uh, still some downsides to that scenario, I think. Okay. Um, so the solution I end up using next is forwarding target for selector and NS proxy uh, as a way to work around the issues with autocomplete not working. Um, so just a little background on what happens when an object perceives a message. So I'm gonna consult Mike Ash's blog, uh, who provides some great information about this. If you have code like object foo and pass hello to it, and you get back an end as a result, basically what the compiler makes that into is uh, this objc message send function call. And you can see that the first argument passed there is the object, and then the selector, as we talked about, talked about before, those being the hidden first and second arguments. Um, and then hello uh, as the actual argument. And the way that OBJ message send will work is it will search the class hierarchy for the methods implementation. So when you uh, call a method on an object, first OBJ C message send will search that object's methods and then its superclasses and then its superclasses on up, up the chain until it finds the method. Uh, if it does find the method, then the implementation, which is just a function pointer, is cached. That way in the future, it doesn't have to do this expensive lookup process. Uh, and then if found, it will just jump to the function pointer um, and uh, start calling the methods actual code. But what happens if a method is not implemented, as it uh, will be in our case? So first, uh, resolve instance method or resolve class method, uh, as it depends, are called. 
Um, though what these methods are used for is allowing the object away to add the actual implementation to the object when they're called. Um, it's known as lazy method resolution. So when you use this approach, you get to add a real implementation that can be cached and basically be a normal method uh, if you'd like to do that. This is something that uh, Core Data, I think, uses to handle its dynamic properties. If that's not called, then forwarding target for selector uh, is the next thing called. Uh, this basically passes your object to selector and you can return another object. The object you return from this will basically have the selector forwarded to it. So it just gives you a really easy way to pass on a message to another object um, in a really uh, simple and fast forwarding solution that works at runtime. Uh, next, if you don't implement the previous two things, then method signature for selector uh, and then forward invocation are called. So method, sign method signature for selector um, is something that returns an NS method signature. We saw it used before for the NS invocation, uh, and it basically describes the shape of the method, like what kind of arguments it takes. And then forward invocation is called, which gives you a lot more flexibility than, say, forwarding target for selector. So whereas forwarding target for selector just passes on the message, with forward invocation, you have an NS invocation object where you can manipulate the arguments, you can send the invocation out to multiple different objects if you'd like to, so it gives you a lot more flexibility at the cost of being a lot slower than the previous two approaches. Uh, and finally, if none of that happens, then you get to does not recognize selector, um, which uh, you've probably seen before in crash reports. Uh, you don't want to get to this point. But the thing that we're going to use is forwarding target for selector for this approach. So what we're going to use in conjunction with forwarding target for selector is NS proxy. So if you aren't familiar with it, NS proxy uh, doesn't inherit from NS object. Um, NS object has methods like init and copy that will not be present on NS proxy. It's its own root class in the hierarchy. Uh, but it's important to note that NS proxy does conform to the NS object protocol, which is a distinct thing. Uh, the protocol has things like class and is equal and hash, um, and you can, uh, um, and those, all of those things exist on NS proxy. You can call all those methods. But the idea is because NS proxy doesn't implement many methods, it works really well with forwarding target for selector. So here's the plan we're going to make a subclass of NS proxy and then forward messages to the real class with NS class from string. So this is going to look really simple to the previous approach I used when we had an NS object subclass. Uh, the interface is exactly the same. Um, we just um, subclass NS proxy instead of NS object. Then in the implementation, we do the same thing with dash W incomplete implementation. Um, and the only method we're going to implement is forwarding target for selector as a class method. And we're just going to forward all the messages we receive um, to the real class that we load with NS class from string. And then when we call class methods, they look a lot more like normal Objective-C. Um, we do hz add colony in this case, and we can type out the regular method name uh, without um, making the code look any different. This looks exactly the same as calling the real code, except for that hz prefix. Uh, and as you can see, this way is a lot easier. <laughs> this time, it takes me about eight seconds, and I have autocomplete. It's really easy to work through this method. So, trust me, it's totally worth it, guys. Try typing without autocomplete in Xcode. It's a real nightmare. So the benefits we get from this approach are we get static typing, and we get really readable code, and we get autocomplete. Uh, those are all really great things to have. Uh, I have a couple of caveats about using this approach. The first thing to know is that NS proxy does implement some methods like alloc and hash that we talked about from the NS object protocol. Um, so if you want to forward those, which you probably do, you can either override those methods in your proxy and manually forward them instead of using forwarding target for selector because they're not going to hit that. Or you can use a custom proxy class like MA proxy. Um, that's something that Mike Ash has written, and it's basically just like NS proxy, but it implements even fewer methods. So it's much more convenient for forwarding uh, messages than NS proxy even is. Uh, another caveat I want to add about just really calling code at runtime in general is that if a library is not referenced at all, then its code won't be included in the final app. 
Um, and that's really only relevant if you're in a situation like a mediation situation where we're not expecting any of this code to be uh, present or to be called by the developer's app. Um, but if the developer adds dash OVJC to other linker flags, it will tell the linker to load all the Objective-C code and not leave anything out, even if it's unreferenced. So you might want to do that. Um, and just as a side note, um, because of a longstanding bug with static libraries, where when they have category methods, they're not loaded if dash OBJC is not present, um, you can basically add a category to your static library. If the category method is not present, it means dash OBJC is not there, so you can print like a warning message to the developer or something about why that's important for them to add. Uh, so I just want to do a slight like dry up my code a little bit from the previous slides. Uh, and move some of this uh, common logic to HZ class proxy, which is what I'm using at work. Um, I have a first and abstract method called HZ proxy class name, which subclasses just override to return what uh, class they want to proxy to, basically. And then I can add common methods there, like HZ proxy class is available to check if those uh, objects are actually there. Um, the important thing to note here is you'll note that both of the methods start with HZ. The reason is because, again, we don't want to have any shared method overlap between the proxy class we're using and the real class, because if the proxy class implements the method, it's not going to hit forwarding target for selector and not going to be forwarded to the real class like we actually want. Uh, and then the implementation here is really simple. Um, in the abstract method, I'm just throwing an exception saying to overwrite it. Uh, in the proxy classes available, I check if I uh, load it up with NS Classroom string, and if that value is not nil, then it's there. Uh, and finally, forwarding target for selector just uses NS Classroom string like we saw before. Uh, so just concluding this little section, I think forwarding target for selector and NS Proxy can be a really good solution to this sort of problem. Uh, it's worked out really well for us without any real problems. Uh, so next, I want to talk about interacting with different types of things. Mostly, I've just talked about calling methods so far. Um, and properties are actually pretty much just the same. To do it with this approach, um, we just add properties to the proxy class's header file. Uh, and it looks just like our methods. Basically, because properties are just generating getter and setter methods, it's exactly the same uh, as if we had written those getter and set the setter methods in the interface ourselves. Uh, and then those will be forwarded on to the real object. Uh, protocols are also really easy to handle at runtime as well. Um, if you want to interact with another protocol, then you can make your own namespace protocol with the same methods. Uh, and this one is a protocol I'm uh, trying to interact with is called add colony delegate. So I named mine hz add colony delegate. Uh, and again, copy and paste the same methods from the real one into here. Um, and that's really all you need to do to interact with protocols because usually people don't interact with protocols at runtime. The only thing you might want to do is override a method called conforms to protocol uh, where you can say, uh, you can load up a protocol at runtime with NS protocol from string. Here I load up add colony add delegate. Uh, I check if it's equivalent to the protocol that's been passed to me. And since these are functionally the same, I'll return yes in that scenario. Otherwise, I'll go up the superclass hierarchy and call super with conforms to protocol. Usually, again, not necessary because people just use response to selector when they're using protocols. So this is really just uh, for completeness that I even mentioned this. Uh, so next, I want to get on a totally different tack and talk about how you might load constants at runtime, uh, which is a bit of a different process. So you can use CF bundle get data pointer for name to load up a constant. And here I have this example where I'm loading up a struct at runtime. So I have three code snippets here. In the top code snippet, uh, it's showing a constant that's in Facebook's SDK. And I'm going to show uh, how I want to load this KFD add size height 50 banner constant. And I'm going to use CF bundle get data pointer for name, which is from Apple's uh, CF bundle part of core foundation to do this. So the first argument that it takes is a CF bundle ref. Um, and pretty much always you use CF bundle get main bundle, which is equivalent basically to NS bundle main bundle. It's the bundle where all of your apps, classes, and all the third party code's gonna be. The only case where you'd not wanna use the main bundle is if you are loading maybe one of Apple's private frameworks, which would be in a separate bundle, or maybe if you're on OS X, um, I know that they might deal with different bundles because they're dynamically loading code. Uh, the second argument is just a CF string, 
and I just use the CF stir macro uh, to pass it a C string and get back a CF string. Um, that's pretty obvious. So CF bundle get data pointer for name returns a pointer to our struct. So what we're going to do is check if that pointer is not null. That basically tells us that the lookup has succeeded. And if it's not null, then we'll dereference the pointer and return the actual struct. So that gives us the ability to load all of these constants at runtime. So kind of a cool thing is that CF bundle get data pointer for name is open source, just like all of Apple's core foundation code. So we can look up and see just actually how this is working. Uh, so in the CF bundle get data pointer for name implementation, um, you can see that it just calls this underscore CF bundle dlfcn get symbol my name. Uh, that function calls a method of the same name, but it ends with with search. And then that functionally, function finally calls dlsim. dlsim is a pretty cool function. Um, it loads a symbol at runtime. It's performing the same role as CF bundle get data pointer for name. Uh, and it's actually part of the POSIX standard. If you Google DLSIM, you're more likely to find Linux docs than anything about iOS. Um, but you do find it used to find on, or you do find it used on iOS sometimes. Um, for example, the library KIF, um, which is an iOS automation testing framework, it uses a lot of private libraries, and it uses DLSIM to load the app support framework at runtime so that it can do cool stuff like enable the accessibility to inspector on the simulator without requiring the developer to manually do that. So just an example of how to use DLSIM. Uh, in the top code snippet, I have the um, header fire where DLSIM is. The first argument it takes is this handle, which I confess to not really fully understand all the implications of it. Um, but basically, it performs a similar role to the CF bundle argument uh, that's used in the previous function. Uh, and typically, what you want to pass for that is this RTLD underscore default, which um, basically searches the uh, all of the symbols in that current process. The only time where you wouldn't want to do something like that is again, um, if you're maybe loading a private framework, framework that Apple has. So DLSIM, just like CF bundle, get data pointer for name, returns a pointer to our struct. We check if the pointer is non-null, and if so, we returned it, and we've looked up this C constant, uh, and you can also use it to look up Objective-C values like in a string. Um, it's really flexible like that. So I have a lot of caveats to using these two functions. Uh, they're like really sort of a nightmare to deal with. First of all, a little background on the default compiler optimization level. Um, at development, it's dash O zero, and in release builds, it's dash OS by default. So the issue that I was running into was at dash OS compiler optimization levels, constants that were not referenced anywhere on the app statically were completely compiled out of the binary. You could not load them with CF bundle get data pointer for name. Uh, as you can imagine, this was a really fun bug because developers would test and everything would work, and then when they released the actual app store, everything would fall apart. Um, so maybe just one reason why you might want to test with your release configuration build settings as well. Um, it's something to be aware of. But of course, I can no longer reproduce this. I submitted a bug report to Apple. I don't know if it made a difference, but a, a few months later in the new Xcode, things were suddenly working again. I have no idea if they were like it was a bug before or not really. Uh, more caveats I have about using these two functions are that I've never gotten them to work with Adobe Air Games. Um, this is some sort of like flash to uh, like native development tool that game developers sometimes use, and I don't know what they're doing to make it not work, but it just doesn't work on any of their games. Um, I guess like some weird compiler flag is causing it to happen. Uh, also, at one point the function was not working at all for symbols from Google AdMobs SDK. Uh, again, I have no idea why. A few months later, things started working. There was no indication of what could cause this issue. Uh, I tried for a long time and had a big stack overflow bounty to solve it. Go ahead. Uh, that's a good question. So um, in all of my testing, I was just getting null pointers back. Um, there is, when you use DLSIM, a DLSIM error function that you can use to check if null is like actually an error or the real value, but I don't think it gives any more details. So basically what I was getting back was just a null pointer uh, with no other information. Um, so this was using, at the time, just CF bundle get data pointer for name. 
and I use the C up bundle get all bundle um, to like iterate through every bundle and could load anything. Um, and I think that's about all the configuration you can do. Uh, it would have been good to go back and try DL sim, but uh, eventually Google AdMobs SDK just started working. Um, so I didn't have to do that basically. Uh, so my recommendation if you're using either of these two functions uh, is to have a fallback to a hard coded value. It's not ideal, but usually constants don't change that much, you know, you might figure that given the name. Uh, so it's not that unsafe to do, and it's certainly better than crashing if uh, that's the only alternative you have to it not working. Uh, so C functions are very similar. You can just use CF bundle get function pointer for name, uh, or DL sim to load those up just like constants. So I'm not gonna go into those really at all because uh, pretty much the previous coverage worked for them as well. So next, I want to talk about creating classes at runtime. Um, so you can create classes, you can create properties, instance variables, protocols, et cetera, all at runtime. And you can add them to existing classes or new ones. Objective-C is really flexible about that. Um, and really, this is a topic all on its own. So there are some Mike Ash blog posts that I direct you to for a couple more details. Um, but I will show a code sample of sort of how I'm using it uh, and some example use cases you might have. So uh, what I need to do is uh, in our SDK, AdMob provides this UI view subclass. It's called GAD Native App Install Add View. And I want to subclass that. I need to know when that view is added to the window. So typically what I do is I'd subclass it and override did move to window, but I can't create that compile time dependency on AdMob, uh, which is the reason that I'm doing this all at runtime. So the way that that looks is first, you get the super class that you want to use to create your new class with NS class from string. Next, you call this function objc allocate class pair and pass the super class and uh, the name of the subclass is a C string and that gives you back your subclass. Then you can use a function like class add ivar on your subclass and the second argument is the name of the ivar you wanna use. I'm adding a delegate to my new subclass so that way uh, when methods are called on it, I can pass them on to the delegate and from there the rest of my code. Uh, next, I create an implementation, which is basically a function pointer with this imp implementation with block. Um, this method or excuse me, function was not always available, but they eventually added it and it's really convenient for creating a function um, because blocks are so simple. The first thing I do is I call objc message send super uh, and give it the selector that uh, I want to call super on. Then I use object get ivar to uh, grab the instance variable that I added before. And finally, on that instance variable, I just call perform selector to again tell the rest of my code what I'm doing. So that was just the implementation. We haven't actually added it yet, but you can use class add method um, and pass the subclass and the selector if you want to add uh, the implementation. And finally, the method signature at the very end there, that v at, uh, to add it to the method. And finally, call objc register class pair to finish things off. So that's sort of a whirlwind of code, and I skip some details there. Uh, I don't fully understand all of the different ways that you can uh, add methods and such to classes. I haven't gotten too much into it, but I think this would be a good jumping off point if you need to do uh, a similar thing for your own kind of code. Uh, next, enums. Um, enums are unfortunately a purely compiled time construct. Uh, there's really, as far as I know, nothing you can do to get the real enum values. Uh, also, preprocessor macros. Again, a purely compiled time construct, so uh, there's really nothing you can do. In general, I would recommend using constants instead. Uh, constants can be documented. They're real Objective-C values, and they seem to be what Apple uses when it wants to have a constant. They don't use preprocessor macros for that. Uh, so I just recommend following that convention instead. Uh, so that concludes my talk. Um, we had a couple questions throughout, but I'll open it up for more as well. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, are you basically replacing a class that already exists? Yeah, so you can't create a new class that already exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, my gut says that's possible, uh, but I haven't actually done it before. Uh, do, do you like know a solution for you? That's what you're asking. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, sure. Uh, yes. Um, so unfortunately, I know very, very little. Uh, regrettably, game developers, because they use like these external build tools, target back to like iOS 5 and 6. So we target back to iOS 6. Like It'll be years before I can touch any Swift code at work. Um, it's like really sad. Uh, but uh, I think that I think that Swift has like most of these similar features. Uh, I'm not entirely sure because I know that it, part of the design for Swift was that it was going to be more like C++. They were going to reduce some of this dynamism, and that would give them greater runtime performance. Um, that was like one of the original design goals. So I don't know how many compromises they've actually made. Uh, and you will see on some of these functions that you talked about, they have that like. Uh, Swift unavailable um, like attribute that they added in with Clang. So definitely some of the stuff is not possible, but I don't know all of what is and what is not. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so I would imagine that yes, it's drastically more expensive. Uh, and I've not, okay, so I have not done a benchmark where I've figured out how slow or fast Objective-C message send is, but I have profiled our whole SDK a lot, and I've never seen it come up as like even a millisecond of time usage. So you're talking like optimizations, I think of nanoseconds at that point, like all the work that Apple does to make OBJ message send really fast and cache things uh, is not happening. Um, so it's probably adding like basically the overhead of another method call uh, not that bad, but pretty pretty acceptable. I've never had like any of our developers have an issue with that part of it. It's a good question. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, you're exactly right, yes. Um, that's exactly true. Um, that, did everyone like get that? Uh, yeah, basically, you never are getting a real instance of the proxy object you're creating. You're only getting the, you're only interacting with the proxy when you're using class methods. So if you were just using class methods, you would incur the forwarding target for selector cost, but usually wouldn't have to deal with it. Um, that's actually a good point, because you saw when we added properties, we didn't have to make them at dynamic to tell the compiler not to generate implementations. And the reason is because, or excuse me, to generate instance variables uh, and implementations. The reason is because we never call those instance methods. We only get back the real instance uh, when we're using forwarding target for selector. Yeah. Uh, if there's no other questions. All right, guys, uh, just a few closing announcements here. Um, new, new piece of uh, resource for probably not the people here in San Francisco, but uh, we've been recording these talks over the last few months, finally. So uh, if you're interested, uh, you can watch previous talks from NS Meetup at video.nsmeetup.com. It's just a YouTube channel. We've been uh, recording the last few months. So uh, if you're not in San Francisco, like a lot of people on Twitter complain, uh, now you can catch up with NS Meetup. Uh, what else do I want to tell you guys? Oh, um, 
we're going to make sure that uh, Max's slides are tweeted out on the NS Meetup uh, account tonight, and then you can get them tomorrow on nsmeetup.com. Uh, next month, we're going to have uh, what I anticipate a high demand talk. Uh, we're going to have Felix Kraus from Fastlane Tools speak. Uh, if you guys haven't seen it, uh, it's a really great developer open source library that allows you to automate a lot of the uh, crap with working with iTunes Connect uh, and some other great pieces. So if you haven't checked it out, it's on GitHub. It's probably one of the top star projects. Uh, check it out. It's called Fastlane Tools. I believe they just integrated with Fabric. Uh, but make sure you watch the NS Meetup Twitter handle. Uh, I'm going to announce the meetup, and that way you guys can get in before we hit capacity because uh, I'm sure we're going to fill the room. So uh, I appreciate you guys coming out tonight. There's plenty of beer. Uh, there's plenty of snacks and drinks. So please uh, help yourself, and we're here till 9. And if, uh, oh, one more thing. Uh, topics and speakers. If you're interested, please come see me. Uh, we're looking for speakers or topics starting for next year. Thanks again, guys. Enjoy. Thank you.